Aguilar. Yep. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So my name is D++, and the topic for today's panel is Decentralized Exchanges, or DEX for short. Now, I'm thrilled to be here on stage at Bitcoin Miami 2022. Specifically, I'm thrilled to be on the best stage, the <laughs> open source stage. Yeah. This is the real Bitcoin stage. <laughs> Just very quickly about me, I'm a Bitcoin educator. My aim is to bring simple education to the next billion folks. I have a, I have a background in computer engineering. I've worked as an entrepreneur and a coding professor before I devoted my life to Bitcoin maximalism and Bitcoin education. Now, before we dive into the questions on today's topic, I'd love it if our lovely panelists could quickly introduce themselves. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Stewart. I'm the founder of a company called Shirdbits, and I'm here for Spicy Takes. Hey, I'm Josef Kitex, at Josef on Twitter, and I'm an analyst and economist at Trezor. Hey, I'm Liz. Uh, I work on Mempool Space, BISC, uh, Bitcoin TV, and a bunch of other projects. It's great to be here. Hey there, Daniel Buckner. I work at TBD at Block uh, on decentralized identity and protocols. Awesome. So speaking of Block and TBDEX, Daniel, this question is for you. Um, I've gone through the white paper. I, I really think Satoshi was onto something with this whole six-page white paper thing. Can we make that a standard <laughs> just generally? That'd be great. Um, but that said, can you explain like I'm five, distill it, into something that um, maybe explain like I'm for. What is TBDEX? <laughs> Can you walk me through it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a decentralized value exchange protocol, a generalized protocol, um, where you can really exchange any things of value between participants who can locate each other using um, a protocol based on distributed systems and decentralized identity. For the first type of value exchange we're focused on is fiat on and off ramps and being able to get you know, people to exchange Bitcoin you know, for dollars or whatever the local currency is. Um, the interesting thing about the exchange itself is that it, it gives the ability to transfer reputation and trust so in, in a way that's standards-based. So we use centralized identifiers, verifiable credentials. Um, doesn't mean that participants have to require reputation and trust if they don't want to. It's completely optional. But if they do require something, um, they, they can totally do so. So you know, if it's a bank, they probably will require some sort of credential. Um, if it's not, if it's like peers, they, they might not. They might just require peer reputation. Um, an interesting thing about the protocol is that it's actually useful even beyond the stage of fiat. So imagine we're in a hyper-Bitcoinized world and you want to buy a car with Bitcoin. Well, it turns out that this value exchange protocol um, can cover that use case in the sense that you might be able to locate and find you know, all the cars available out there. And then you want to know that the car you know, that you're buying is backed by, you know, it's, it's the uh, pink slip, right, is valid, and the person has money in their account, right? So these are things that you can exchange as reputational proofs um, in the process. And the last thing I'll note is that the protocol is built on a generalized, decentralized app platform. So this is kind of the first app we're building on top of it, and we'll have more news about that platform uh, in the coming months. Okay, uh, let me say it back to you. Yeah. So TVDEX is a messaging protocol mm -hmm. that I can use to discover people um, or financial institutions. So if I'm using it to discover other people, could it be used in a peer-to-peer -peer sort of local Bitcoin type of way? Absolutely, yeah. So the, the protocol, the use of decentralized identifiers in the protocol enables you to find any participants in whatever type of value exchange you want to do, um, whether it's currency or just any other type of good, um, and then be able to communicate with them privately, securely, and encrypted. Uh, exchange reputational proofs and sort of come to agreement about, you know, selling and buying of, of any type of goods. Okay, so I can discover other people. So let's say Alice and Bob, mm -hmm. our friends Alice and Bob, meet by way of the TBDEX protocol. So they can transact Bitcoin, of course. 
what other types of things can Alice and Bob do now that they've found each other? It's so romantic. Um, <laughs> uh, this question is for Chris. What else could they do now? Um, yeah, once they've, they've found each other, uh, they, they can build things like discrete log contracts. But what I'd what I have to say to the audience is that what I think Bitcoiners get right is uh, they're really focused on censorship-resistant money. Um, and I think we all in this room agree that that's kind of one of the core principles of Bitcoin. You can spend your Bitcoin how you want to. What I think Bitcoiners get wrong is uh, they stop at censorship-resistant money and don't advocate for censorship-resistant financial markets. What my understanding of TBD is and BISC, which Wiz works on, um, is that's what they're providing is censorship-resistant financial markets where people can trade different things. Um, Bitcoiners sometimes get up in arms about what's being traded on these censorship-resistant financial markets because it's a token they don't like or it's economic activity that they aren't fans of. But um, you know, if something's censorship-resistant, you can't pick and choose uh, what you like and what you don't like. It's a platform ev either everybody can use for everything or nobody can use because it's gonna get coerced and co-opted by a government or a large corporation. Okay, so then on that topic of censorship resistance, I feel like we're all gonna have something to say on this and it's important to everyone here. But Wiz, how does censorship resistance play into BISC? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, BISC is basically a decentralized exchange platform, which means that it's a peer-to-peer -peer network running over Tor, where everyone running the BISC node software on their computer connects to each other and exchanges the order books. And this allows users to make offers or take offers and uh, connect to each other. And because there is no uh, centralized servers anywhere, it just uh, you know, achieves uh, censorship resistance by being decentralized in nature. There's no uh, BISC office or BISC company to shut down. It's more of a trade protocol. OK, so can it be stopped? Can it be shut down? Um, I guess if. Um, Tor had some issues, uh, which has happened in the past, sure. Um, I mean, BISC is um, also governed by a, a DAO to um, manage the parameters of the network, like uh, what the trading fees are and like this, and uh, other uh, limits or payment methods. These are all controlled by the DAO, which has a um, kind of like a, a unique governance structure. Um, basically, they have their own uh, shitcoin token where they do the voting, <laughs> and uh, they DAO stakeholders can vote to change certain parameters, um, but the DAO stakeholders are not known. And so because of their uh, relative anonymity and the decentralized nature, it's not easily censorable. OK. Uh, do you think the shitcoin token is really necessary? Uh, no, personally, I don't. Um, I don't. I don't use it. I, I'm a Bitcoiner, you know. Uh, and, and you don't need to use their shitcoin to use BISC. You can just uh, pay the trade fees in, in good old sats, and it works great. It's only if you really want to participate in the governance of the network, which is mostly just the contributors anyway, at the end of the day. So I'm curious for the audience, how many of you are customers of BISC? How many of you are passionate about peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchange generally? How many of you find local Bitcoiners in your area and exchange cash for Bitcoin? And how many of you earn Bitcoin, and get paid in Bitcoin, which is one of the best ways of getting KYC free Bitcoin? So Pete, speaking of KYC, Wiz, I'm sure you're going to have a hot take on this as well. Um, you know, there is illicit activity happening on Bitcoin. And the illicit activity is KYC, <laughs> know your customer. Is KYC going to be necessary on decentralized exchanges? No, if it's a uh, peer-to-peer -peer exchange, then um, the only two people who need to know about each other are the, the two counterparties of the transaction. Um, because it's, it's purely decentralized in nature and there is no regulator um, enforcing any rules, it's purely peer-to-peer. -peer. So uh, it's kind of like Craigslist if you post an ad to sell your sofa and someone buys it. The only two people who know about the details of that transaction are the buyer and the seller. And that's exactly how it works on BISC. The only person you send your uh, bank details, for example, would be to the other guy. And it's not in either of those parties' interest to snitch on each other. So uh, it achieves a very nice level of privacy and uh, also censorship resistance this way. 
Um, can, uh, yeah, I just please. want to chime in here because I think it's like a really important point uh, what Wiz is bringing up here is like, you can start with something that's um, censorship resistant and doesn't have AML KYC at the base layer, and you can always add it on top if that's a feature that is required. And I think that's an acceptable trade-off. But if you bake in like all these like regulations at the base layer, you can never have something that's no AML KYC on top of that. So getting these like levels of the stack engineered correctly are really important, and that's like kind of one of the core innovations of Bitcoin, in my opinion, is. We have this censorship resistant money, this is strictly a proto computer protocol, and we can build you know, financial institutions on top of it. And, you know, many financial institutions have been super successful built on top of Bitcoin, but we can't go uh, the opposite way. So when thinking about designing these things, it's super important to get the base level right without you know, these, these things baked in. And if you wanna add them on top, go for it. And that's my two sats on that. All right, why don't we back up? We've talked about TB Dex, but why don't we start with why? Why decentralized exchanges? Why does this matter and why should we care? Um, Yosef, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so uh, decentralized exchanges for me are important for three reasons. First is uh, you are actually forced to self-custody your Bitcoin from the start because uh, these exchanges never hold your keys for you. and. Um, Unfortunately, the default setting for centralized exchanges is they are the custodians and people tend to not withdraw their coins. So that's the first one, self-custody. The second one is you actually get to use Bitcoin as a protocol because on centralized exchanges, you usually just buy some kind of weird financial derivative that's uh, maybe uh, settleable in like physical Bitcoin if you withdraw, but most people don't withdraw from these exchanges so they don't actually get to use Bitcoin, whereas at BISC you use uh, multisig, you are confronted with uh, like handling your private keys and with minor fees and stuff. And the third one is the privacy aspect. There is no KYC, uh, only the counterparty knows some of your details, but there is no reason to snitch, as we said. And uh, yeah, KYC is this whole, uh, like, like we said, that's the illicit activity, that's the taint because it stays with you. And once you KYC yourself, uh, it's hard to get rid of uh, because uh, these exchanges employ uh, like the chain analytic companies and uh, privacy in Bitcoin is hard. And if you like uh, dox yourself at the start, uh, it's very hard to uh, correct that. Yeah, that's a great topic, actually, of privacy in general. I'm, I'm curious for Wiz, what kind of privacy information would I be concerned about, say, leaking to my counterparty if I'm exchanging peer-to-peer -peer on BISC? Yeah, that's a good question. It really depends on the payment method. Um, the most private might be uh, meeting in person at the Starbucks and just handing cash to someone. Um, there's also a U.S. Postal money order. You can like physically mail a money order to someone for like a thousand bucks, and uh, the post office website allows you to verify that the money order serial number and the amount, everything was cashed or not cashed. So you can, uh, you know, verify um, without going through the banking system, but also be able to send the money. Of course, if you use a payment method like a bank transfer, then you'll need to send your bank account details to the counterparty, but. Um, it's not really in, in the uh, other guy's interest to, um, you know, save those or, or dox you for any reason. So there's different trade-offs with different payment methods. Uh, some of them are faster or slower. Some of them are more expensive or cheaper. Some of them are more private or less private. Um, and it also depends on the country. If you're, you know, in Japan, for example, you can actually do anonymous bank transfers. Um, if you're in the U.S., the postal money order is excellent, um, but, but every country has their own uh, localized payment method, so it really depends on your threat model, I guess. So cash in the mail, cash in person. I mean, I don't own any Bitcoin, but if I did... Uh, <laughs> A lot of people in the crowd do, though. If, you know, if I did, I would use the, uh, the U.S. postal money order system on BISC. It's, uh, it's pretty cool because it's basically how people sent money to each other before banks were uh, what they are today. And uh, because the post office has this really cool website where you can verify everything, um, you know, no one can claim that you didn't send them the money or everything. Like it shows what post office it was cashed at and everything. So it's really uh, well built for um, BISC users in the United States. 
I noticed that Strike is one option. What kind of <coughs> privacy would I be expected to leak, say, if I were to use Strike to pay on BISC? Um, I guess Strike is, is um, a newer payment option. Um, I, haven't, I don't have a Strike account, so I've never used it. But if, uh, if that's true, then I would assume it works like any other um, payment method. Um, I mean, obviously, Strike, you need to connect to your bank account, but the counterpart or counterparty wouldn't be able to see that. Right. I, I believe they receive fiat on the other side of that trade. So that's a great, I think, payment method that now exists on BISC. Um, I've got like a thousand questions for Daniel, and I think we're probably not going to have enough time. We'll probably have to talk later. But I'm curious to hear more about TB Dex. Um, my understanding is that TB Dex cannot exist without some kind of verifiable credential some kind of system of trust, right? And the reason for that is because Bitcoin, of course, is trustless, but the fiat system is not. And when you're exchanging with another person, there is some level of trust that's going to be required. Now, my understanding is that TBDEX is predicated upon decentralized identity, or DID for short. And again, if you could explain like I'm five or preferably explain like I'm four, what is DID, and how is it used by DEX? Yeah, so DID is um, the standard that has you know, gone through international standardization at W3C. Um, we're using it, a lot of other companies are. Um, it allows you to create identifiers that are wholly yours that you can rotate keys under and you can prove. So unlike an email address, you actually own your identifier um, and, and can have the full routability to, like, be, to send messages to someone. Um, you can have multiple identifiers, so and we encourage that. It's not like one identifier and you keep using it everywhere to correlate yourself. Like you want to um, retain privacy. And then the other big component is verifiable credentials, which is sort of like a data signing standard, basically, for proofs. And it can be proofs of anything, right? You can prove a diploma or whatever. In this case, you might prove KYC details or reputational proofs if it's like peer-to-peer -peer and you don't need like a KYC component. It's just modeling it with a standard. So whatever your form of reputation or proof is, we're trying to use these, these standardized forms for it. That's really interesting because in BISC there is no identity system. There is no reputation system. Um, the BISC DAO basically uh, guarantees the trades if you were to get scammed or something, which um, because of the security deposit system is financially disincentivized. So in BISC, there is no identity system because we want privacy. We want an anonymity. Um, you know, you could cre you know, create a new BISC account for every trade, and, or you, you could use the same one. There is no um, identity. Yeah, I think there's a misnomer, right, with identity. People, you hear the word identity, people get really scared, right? Identity just means an identifier you use. It could be a single-use identifier, like a burner, right? You can make a DID in a second. It has no reputation. You're just using it to do the messaging exchange. And that's kind of how, how we work it. Um, and so identity, you have an identity, but you may have many facets of your identity. You may have millions of identifiers, right? Every website you use a new one. Um, so, so we believe in exactly the same thing. It's just a standardized means of, doing, of locating um, people if you needed to in a recurring fashion. The other thing is we want to make on and off ramping to existing financial institutions easier only because it's the world we live in today. Like I'm, I'm a big, you know, I've been Bitcoin for 10 years, like I you know, want that as much as anyone, but the reality on the ground is that we need to get more people into Bitcoin, so we have to bring the world with us, and that's part of the reason why we added these features that are totally optional, so that those institutions can start helping by participating in the system um, and increasing the number of people who have Bitcoin. Yeah, so, so my question is, uh... Would uh, DBD, uh, DID be compatible with stuff like FIDO2? Like, uh, you know, there's this open standard for uh, online identification. It's, I believe, FICE, uh, fast identification online. Yeah. And Trezor is, uh, like, supports that. So uh, I could uh, prove my identity, like, um, like credentials, not my real identity, but I'm the same person like the last time we've signing some kind of cryptographic message. Yeah, so I actually, I worked on some FIDO stuff while I was at Microsoft, uh, you know, I was on the identity and security team. Um, FIDO is, is a great standard. We're, we were looking at, towards the end of my tenure there, doing extensions so that your DIDs, which are backed by keys you own, um, can go through that same existing standard. FIDO, right now, um, the way it's designed, it sort of assumes that you're using a single key, just a non-rollable key, and the PKI source is like a centralized entity. So you have like a key with a website, 
and you have to go register it with them. So it's kind of not designed to be decentralized. You can extend it though. Um, I also, we did extend OpenID Connect so that it uses DIDs instead of centralized accounts. So there's, there's ways that we can uplift these things into more decentralized forms. Yeah, yeah. and I, I wanted to ask if I may, uh, like, uh, BISC sort of uses reputation because there's uh, the account age, is that right, and number of trades, I believe, and you tend to choose like these accounts first. It depends on the payment method, right? Yeah. So um, I think in the US, um, there's a payment method called Zelle, which is, uh, I guess, the common way to quickly send money between banks in the US. And because there is a very uh, small amount of chargeback risk, it's not zero, mm -hmm. uh, they implemented a small limit for new accounts. And once you trade a few times uh, that with other counterparties who are signed, then they'll sign your account to build this uh, kind of like decentralized web of trust. They're not signing your identity so much as they are your the hash of your payment account. So uh, I guess, yeah, you could consider that payment account an identity. Mm -hmm. a, yeah, I would call that a pseudonymous identity, yeah, right? Sure, so yeah. you're gonna any, any identifier you have in the world, it's, if it's a point of reference, really, when we talk about identifiers <clears throat> like email or even you know, your at name on Twitter, it's a point of reference. So someone is able to accrue reputation or, or use it in any way, it forms an identity. Now, let's not confuse like personal identity, like you as a person yeah. with that identity. Identity just means like, I could be a dog on the internet but I'm this hash of this dog, right? So yeah, I, I think it's a scary word, but it's kind of, it's a little overblown. And yeah. like piggybacking off of that, like I think maybe uh, one of the ways you can think about identity is simply a public key, right? A public key is an identity. And on the Lightning Network, for instance, you know, our identity is our public key with an IP address, and that's how, how you connect. And a question I have for you is, um, how, uh, you know, to make this a little bit more concrete, would you say that, you know, if DIDs should be included in the Lightning spec to be that form of identity? Or how would um, DIDs compare and contrast to the current form of identity on the Lightning Network, which is the public key and IP address? Yeah, so I, I do, I think it would be great if, if Lightning did embrace the DID spec. The spec is not actually prescriptive in terms of how you would implement a decentralized identity network. Like when I was at Microsoft and not Block working with ION, which is like a layer two on Bitcoin to do DIDs, um, it's mostly a data model, so it's like, okay. Every type of DID method, right, you could create one for ION, spits out the same PKI document so that everyone can, like, you know, in a standard way, can find the keys and routing endpoints. Like, how much data? Um, not much. It's not personal identity. Like, the DIDs themselves don't have any. So, like, a 33 byte public key is what we have on, you know, Lightning today. I'm guessing it's more than that. We're talking yeah. kilobytes, megabytes. Oh, oh, less, you know, maybe two kilobytes at max. It's just okay. public keys and routing references. It could be decentralized URIs to, like, how I message you. Right, okay. you look up an ID or like need that. It's like um, the equivalent would be like DNS, right? You look up a zone file, sure. right? It's that, you don't put your website in a zone file, right? So um, it's really important because I think it gives efficient lookups and, and locational finding that could be even better potentially than some of the constructs in Lightning that are required because they're doing path finding for yeah. like liquidity and stuff. Okay. It kind of feels like um, the more modern way to do a decentralized web of trust. Like back in the day we would have um, you know, key signing parties where, where you would meet in person and sign each other's PGP key. But now it seems like maybe um, there's also going to be the entry of uh, corporations that will basically KYC people and sign their key for them. So you'll have like at Wiz, at, uh, you know, Twitter, for example, or, or maybe some uh, block or, or square, right? You could be at Wiz, at square, and that's KYC. But if you're at Wiz, at BISC or something, you know, maybe it's not KYC. And that depending on who signed what keys, you might want to trade on this, trade with this person based on those things, right? Yeah, that's exactly what verifiable credentials are. So like, let's say in one context of your life, you use a given identifier and you accrue reputational trust. Like I get a degree from an institution or something like that. Those are all verifiable credentials, right? Like LinkedIn may soon accept these and say, oh, I can like verify that this institution that has a DID signed this proof and it is you who's in with zero knowledge proving that you actually are the, the holder of the keys that back it. So absolutely. Yeah. So my understanding is that we're doing a zero knowledge proof without the need for ZKP cryptography. Oh no, I mean, so some of the credentials definitely will use ZKP stuff. Like um, I worked on a snark construction with uh, MSR colleagues uh, when I was at Microsoft that we are looking to implement in the community that's, um, yeah, it's a, you know, you're familiar with snarks, right? Um, and it is a zero knowledge credential that you could say, like, let's say a credential had like 10 things you can prove in it. 
You could do selective disclosure where you only want to disclose a few of them. You could do predicates where you say, like, I'm just over this age, like, you know, range proof, stuff like mm -hmm. that. And those can be more advanced constructions of credentials. Well, like I said, Daniel, I'm going to have a thousand more <laughs> questions for you after. So I hope you have some time later this week. And I want to say thank you so much to all of the panelists. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I'm very excited for the future of the re-decentralization of the web, which will hopefully be using some of these exciting technologies that we discussed today, and which definitely will not be some kind of Web3 VC-backed <laughs> Yeah. shitcoin dino decentralized <laughs> in name only blockchain it's going to be the real decentralized web and it's going to use bitcoin and bitcoin yeah. only yeah absolutely yeah.